Welcome to the NBA Coast to Coast podcast brought to you by thelines.com. Coming to you from the West Coast, Josh Lander, joined by my guy Nate Weitzer on the East Coast. And it's the second night of regular season basketball that we are talking about here, Nate. Uh, and we are going to be looking at uh, a couple games tonight and our player props videos. Definitely want to make sure you are liked and subscribed to that page. Continue to follow along with us as we're coming at you guys all regular season long, each and every weekday with these game lines and player props videos. Also want to make sure you head to thelines.com. Check out all the great content Nate and the gang have up there for you guys. Also have our great odds finder tool up there so that you can make sure you are shopping all of those lines to the best of your ability across the NBA this season, such as these games we have for Wednesday night in the NBA. Nate, let's get into it. Yeah, huge slate, to, lots to pick from, of course. So I'll just read off the lines. We got Magic plus three and a half at Pistons. Wiz minus two and a half at the Pacers. The Pelicans plus three at Nets, definitely intriguing there. I'm sitting on the sidelines until I see what those Nets look like. Knicks plus five at the Grizzlies. Rockets are plus 10 at the Hawks. Bulls plus six at Heat. Cavs plus two and a half at Raptors. We will break down that game for you. Uh, the Thunder are plus 11 at Minnesota. High hopes there. Charlotte with LaMelo Ball questionable. Minus one and a half at the Spurs. The Nuggets minus seven and a half at the We're Not Tanking Jazz. The Mavs are plus four at Phoenix in an immediate revenge game. We're going to get into that one. Blazers plus one and a half at Kings to round it out with a 226 and a half total in that one. But yeah, we're talking Cavs and Raptors here. Uh, two teams that, despite their kind of wonky seasons, are, are pretty similar in terms of what they bring to the table. I do believe um, now, of course, the Cavs integrating Donovan Mitchell. I don't think it's going to be an immediate process in terms of them just turning into an offensive juggernaut. I think they're still going to be a team that plays a bit slower, uh, a bit more methodical, and, and leans on that defensive rim protection. That being said, uh, I think the general trend might be more overs than unders here to open the NBA season. I mean, maybe we're a little bit blinded by how the NFL, so many offenses came out looking absolutely putrid after training camp. But really, the NBA just continues to evolve in the direction of you not being able to hand check anybody um, and freedom of player movement, increased player skill, increased space and pace. Um, And and teams are going to get free flowing. But the reason... The, the angle I'm looking at here with Raptors Cavs is that both of them have enough wing defenders to deal with the others. Um, and that's why I think we're going to see a close game. I know you can't necessarily bet on a close game unless you take win margin, though, Josh. I mean, plus 410 for the Raptors to win by five or less, plus 440 for the Cavs to win by five or less. If you bet both, what are you getting? Like plus 225, right? Somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. So you can find that market for sure. Uh, I'm not really ready to take Cleveland on the road in their very first game with these heightened expectations, but they did get the Raptors in three to open the season uh, before you know complete losing badly without Jared Allen. Something to say about each of those games. I mean, they won in game one despite Colin Sexton mucking up their offense and going four for 18 from the field. Uh, Donovan Mitchell, obviously an upgrade there. They won game two. That was just a throwaway COVID game. Uh, and then game three, Fred Van Fleet absence for the Raptors as the Raptors lose by eight. So kind of simple logic there uh, that, you know, they should be a lot more competitive with FEV in the lineup. Uh, the Cavs are going to have Donovan Mitchell going here. And uh, yeah, so basically both teams top notch fourth quarter defense, though. That's the key here. Fourth in points per game allowed for the Raptors, second for the Cavs. So that's why I expect it to slow down, become close down the stretch. And that's why uh, that I'm going with that kind of market. Yeah, no, I think everything within that game theory logic makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I, I just I think there's value on the like. I don't know if I'm just overhyping the the preseason, but the the, the Raptors started to look really bad for a bit, uh, and it was really odd to see the struggles that they were having, just because it's it's a, still a Nick Nurse team. Um, so sort of, uh, it seemed like they were sort of fumbling almost their lineups in a way where it just didn't seem to make a lot of sense uh, with the guys they had out there. Not because Scotty Barnes can't really play uh, from you know from a, a playmaking role um, at his size, but it still just seemed like there was too much size out there to be honest with you, and, and it just wasn't working. So I don't know if if you buy into that that hype or not, but I do think that um, you know 
I, I kind of went in waves with this Cleveland team when, when they got Donovan Mitchell. And I was kind of like, uh, okay, right away, I was like, I love this team. And then I was like, all right, well, let's slow down. There's so many other good teams in the East. These are two teams, right? Like this, this Raptors, Cavs, Hawks team are all sort of on the same tier. And so before we really see them play, and obviously Donovan's new to this team, I think the reason I love it is because the problems that the Cavs had where they were shorthanded last year is exactly what he's able to bring to the table. Um, it is, you know, what, what he did last year individually, uh, you know, 26 points a game. That was good for 13th, fourth most and made threes. I love the fact that last year he had the seventh highest usage of any of, you know, anybody with a minimum amount of minutes worth talking about. Um, yet the 24th most turnovers. So 23 guys had more turnovers than him, but he had the seventh highest usage rate, you know, of anybody in the league. So I love how he sort of come along in that direction. And if he can play that way in, in, in this lineup, then then I still think right now, two and a half points uh, doesn't make any sense for, for Cleveland to be a dog. I think if this game, you know, fast forward a month or two, I do think that this game is going to be something a little bit different. I, I think it, oh, this is another game. I don't love looking at the stats for both of these teams last year. There was too much uh, time missed by OG and Anobi, even Scotty Barnes at times. There was too many injuries that I didn't that that kind of kept that that Raptors team from finding their groove um, at any point in the season really. And for the Cavs, you know what they were with Jared Allen uh, and, and Evan Mobley both healthy in the lineup was everything right and we know exactly what that was with their interior defense uh with the you know the lack of points in the paint that you could get on them the fact that you know they would get the most blocks uh every single week uh in the nba with evan mobley and jared out so like all of that stuff leads me to go it is going to be a gross choppy game in a lot of ways i think um but donovan is sort of the x factor i don't think i think he's just he's the best offensive player in this game uh when it does come to clutch time and the way that the Cavs did struggle in clutch time uh to find a ball handler playmaker and score outside of uh darius garland I think that's what, you know, he, that the Band-Aid is Donovan Mitchell in this one. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that in the long haul for the Cavs in terms of becoming the superior team down the stretch. But I don't know if I'm willing to take an inexperienced team to close down the stretch uh, at Toronto where the Raptors went 17-7 and seven in 2022. You know, now that they finally have fans back in the building and that it's a it's a big right. raucous arena, uh, you know, I, I got to feel confident about the vets there. So I think that's why I give a slight nod to Toronto. Not that Cleveland was bad in clutch time last year. They they had a 156 offensive rating. They did go 22 and 24, whereas Toronto, a ridiculous 181 offensive rating, shot 58 percent and went 26 and 19. So that's why if if I am picking a winner, it's the Raptors. So eke one out at, at home here in the opener, but they Cleveland really does a lot of things to stop what Toronto does well in terms of fast break points, getting to the free throw line uh, with both those guys on the floor, Mobley and Allen. It's going to be very yeah. tough for Toronto to get it going inside. Uh, so maybe a little bit choppier yeah. than we expect at, in, in Mr. Mitchell's debut leading to a close game down the stretch. So yeah, that's just where I'm looking for angles to bet that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel all of that. And I mean, we, we talked about it a lot with Cleveland last year when we, we threw the stat around of what they were on defense with both those guys in the lineup. It was like 106 defensive rating over the course of a ton of minutes with them both on the floor together. That rose all the way up to like 110, right? When when you, you take away one of them and both of them, it was like a few more. So um, I, I do think it's it, it does lend itself to a, a choppier, slower game. I don't really like any of the player props. I know we, we won't really be talking about anybody from this game in our player props tonight, uh, you know, for, for this Wednesday night uh, slate, mostly because, uh, you know, I don't know who's going to score for Toronto. I think it could be anyone, which is, you know, to their credit. Obviously, it's always been their their calling card, except for when they had Kawhi. Um, but, you know, between Van Vliet and Ananobi uh, and Siakam and Barnes, right, that's four guys that, you know, look, to be honest with you, they're all four very close to how good each other is in terms of star power, too. So I don't really love the points there. I like a Darius Garland seven and a half assists because I think the last thing we remember is him uh, getting 10 to 12 assists a game for most of the second half of last season. Um, so, you know, I just I, but we, I don't know what that's going to look like with Donovan Mitchell, as I mentioned, seventh highest usage rate in the in the league last year. So uh, we'll have to see how that all gels and what we like. But I do think we, we are at least in this matchup and not just because it's the first game of the season, but because of the way this matchup works out, uh, expect a little bit more of a, of a choppy game. Mavs are plus four at Phoenix, plus 156 on the money line with a 216 total. As Phoenix, you know, I think rumors of their demise might have reached their ears at this point. Obviously got embarrassed in game seven at home, uh, lost by 33 
to this Mavericks team. So there is certainly a narrative here for them to have circled this a long time ago. But I think more than that, it's just the noise that they're on the backslide, that they're not no longer considered in that inner circle of title contenders after they had the, you know, the greatest clutch regular season we've ever seen um, and didn't <clears throat> necessarily lose any big pieces. I mean, Jay Crowder is disgruntled, but that's not a, a massive issue for them and DeAndre Ayton's contract issue as well. But um, <clears throat> they still have the same talent is the point. And Dallas, I mean, sort of dealing with the same kind of disrespect in terms of people expecting them to slide but I, I do think that Christian Wood not going to make an immediate impact and that, that the loss of Jalen Brunson with his second unit could be an issue on, on a more of a season-long basis. But what we're looking at here is just one game, one night for Phoenix to care a lot more than Dallas because of what happened to them. And that's why I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they just blew doors off them to a degree, but... For them to lead wire to wire at plus 200, don't hate that. I mean, the fact that the spread has dropped to four instead of four and a half makes me think you could just hit Phoenix. You could put them into different teasers on the money line there without the spread um, or parlay that result because I, I do think they're going to be find a way to slow Luka down, which they did in the regular season. Failed to in the playoffs, but he had a 101 offensive rating in those three regular season games. They had won nine straight regular season against Dallas. So whatever happened in that playoff series, I think they put it behind him and, and get this win number one at home. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, my first thought was I really wanted to talk about Dallas and like talk him up because I, I think I'm a, a a little bit of a bigger fan than maybe others of, of Christian Wood and what I think he can bring to the table. I do think the JaVale pick up is also uh, very helpful as they did not even have a center last year outside of, right, like Boban uh, and I guess Davis Bertans, but then it was all, you know, Dwight Powell and uh, Kaliba playing center for this team. So that, that that's not going to work uh, all, all season long. And eventually, uh, you know, you would think it wouldn't have worked in the playoffs against a, a guy like Aiton, but because it, it didn't work all season long last year uh, when, the, when the Suns went 3-0 and against the Mavs in the regular season, obviously before they met in those playoffs. So, um, you know, I, I'm looking at this game to be similar in how all of those went because all of them were very similar in how they went. Uh, all three of them were under 216 points, which is, you know, 216 and a half is what this sits at. Um, you know, the, the defensive ratings were, were pretty good. I mean, I would say, you know, the, the Suns still had their way and it really just was a matter of them kind of grinding down the, the Mavs to death the same way that they kind of just did with every team until they got to the fourth quarter and then just pulled away. Um, and, and really, you know, it, it, that's, that, that was the, the, the tail of the tape uh, with them last year against his team, giving up 101 points in those three games, allowing 42 percent from the field. 35% from three, which is why the Mavs were even able to keep it uh, in single digits when they were losing in these games uh, to, to the Suns last season, right? So it's just their three-point shooting, which I think we like a lot of that. I mean, we expect a lot of that again. I do think with uh, the sort of size upgrade, if you will, in Spencer Dinwiddie, not saying he's a better player than Jalen Brunson, uh, but, you know, the size upgrade means you have the ability for someone to sort of get to the rim a bit more, maybe a few more free throws for Dinwiddie uh, than you were seeing from Brunson, something that, you know, you, you wasn't really there for them last season outside of Luka breaking, you know, people down uh, all the way to the rim at times. So, um, you know, look, I, I, like I said, I wanted to take this team, but just there's no reason based on what we saw last year and, and really the way this is going that not too much has changed this year for the Suns outside of the few things you talked about. Um, I, I don't really see them in, in that locker room, especially when you have Chris Paul and, you know, uh, Devin Booker in the same locker room there at this point, vets that, you know, I don't think they really are wor that worried about uh, all of that stuff. And if they get DeAndre in, in tow with his money now, um, this, this should still be a really good team. I don't know if they'll win 53 games, but we're just talking about this one tonight in a matchup that really suits them. Plus all that revenge stuff you talk about, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of numbers pointing towards the under here. I mean, I can rattle them off if you want. The fact that da Dallas is worse, uh, far, far worse defending the three-point line on the road, though, is what I kind of circle back to and think that the, I, wor I would worry too much that Phoenix is going to put up 116 on their own here. I mean, that's basically what they averaged at home last season, uh, putting up 28 assists per game as well. So I'm steering clear of totals in general and and a little bit what I talked about in the other video. It seems like offenses are hitting the ground running this year uh, more so than we might have expected. So Dallas is going to live and die by the three, though, like you said. And uh, I think if Phoenix motivated, able to close out on those threes, 
uh, eighth in three point percentage allowed on the season, as well as second in assist to turnover ratio. Regular season numbers, fantastic team, able to slow down Luca. And then Dallas is 30th in fourth quarter scoring as well, and now don't, doesn't have Brunson to help close that out. I definitely lean towards the Suns if this winds up being a close one, but like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if the Suns just kind of put a whooping on them. Nate, let's kick off our player props video with, uh, I believe we got Kyrie Irvin kicking things off. Talk to me about Kyrie. Nothing better than taking a point guard after a long layoff, a guy with bounce who's going to have fresh legs, especially if you haven't played that much basketball over the last two years like Kyrie. So uh, 24 and a half is the points total and three and a half three pointers with plus odds on the over. And we were just hammering his props like we talked about with him coming in with fresh legs at the end of last season. And he was consistently going over when we were saying 27 and a half. This is too low. Now the Nets are going to be depending on him, you know, just as much with Ben Simmons in the lineup or Nick Claxton or both at times. Uh, Joe Harris not going to be ready for the opener here. Seth Curry, I don't think, is going to play either. It's just going to be a lot of Kyrie and KD. I mean, and KD probably draws Herb Jones here for most of the game in a much tougher individual matchup. If Kyrie starts on CJ, that's barbecue chicken. I mean, Brandon Ingram's too big. Alvarado is going to come off the bench and try to do his thing. But I mean, somebody who reaches a lot going against the best ball handler in the league, probably not going to pan out. Well, I haven't seen anybody able to stop Kyrie in that mode. And I mean, it's seven straight against Noah. Now he's had at least 24 points and 30 averaging 32.3 on 50, 47, 96 splits. The total is 230 here. The Pels have Zion. So it's, they, they've been incredibly high scoring when they have Zion, uh, 116.4 points per game with a bad defensive rating. I think there's a lot of props you could like here, but I'm just going to go with the safe bet in, in Uncle Drew. Oh, Uncle Drew. Yeah, I mean, he's always fun to bet on uh, for sure, uh, especially just when he gets cooking. You're like, oh, we got this. Um, so, no, I, I like all that. I like points. It's 230 and a half is, is the total, as you said. So there, there's going to be people putting up buckets. And uh, we know that for uh, for the, the Nets, it's really going to be mostly KD and Kyrie, especially when uh, two of their best shooters are still, you know, all over the injury list and Seth Curry uh, and Joe Harris there. So um, I'm going with a guy that we said, you know, it's, it's, it's fucking Dame, Dame Lillard, like 23 and a half points. My man's back. Even money on DK and FanDuel, I believe, for, for taking 23 and a half points right now for Dame against the Kings. Uh, this would be at like 29 and a half, maybe 30 and a half would be this points prop for Dame if this was maybe, uh, you know, last season at the beginning before he got hurt or, uh, you know, the season before. It was definitely 30 and a half the season before. So um, with that 114 defensive rating last year, good for fourth worst for those Kangs. Uh, I guess they're only the Kangs when they're winning. But for the Kings, if you will, uh, allowing 13 threes a game, also good for about seventh worst in the league third highest opponent field goal percentage um, that they gave up. So, I mean, it, it, look, it, I like this Portland team. Uh, I drafted the crap out of them in my fantasy team. I also uh, don't hate a plus 8,000 uh, on, on DraftKings right now for them to be the highest scoring team in the league this season. Um, but I, I do think this is just another opportunity where, look, the people talk about the Kings being better on defense. I, I don't know why. I don't know what they really did that would make you feel that much better at this point. I think you're going to see some really good offense from them that that is going to look nicer than it's looked in Sacramento for a while. Um, but that's just going to lead to more points being scored on the other side as well. So it's going to be a high scoring affair in this one. Yeah. Like you said, it's fucking, it's, fu it's the fucking Catalina wine mixer is, is Dame in California <laughs> against the Kings with a total of two thirty two. I mean, yeah, he, he's going to get his buckets. It, people are calling the Dame, um, just terrorizing people this year after basically sitting out for rest, getting his abdomen completely right. He should be able to do whatever he wants on the court. Hasn't had that much trouble with De'Aaron Fox in his career. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty simple one here. There's going to be a lot of points in this game. <laughs> Moving yeah. on to a rookie, though. I'm interested in both Paolo and Jaden Ivey on the other side in that Magic Pistons game. Because with a rook, you can get a little value in their first game for sure. And the totals are pretty low. Ivey at 11.5 points plus money or even and then Paolo is at 13 and a half, but I think you can go one more point up to get plus 106 at FanDuel here. Okay. Detroit allowing the fifth most points per game to power forwards in their last 15. In their last 15, they went up to a, a much higher pace, 99, went over nine of those games. I mean, what changed during that? I mean, it, 
it's just playing a more freewheeling style. It's more of what Cade was doing with the offense, more of playing Marvin Bagley, who's going to be out for this game, which is actually a little sad for Paolo. You won't get to play against him. But, I mean, these guys, they're throwing out a power forward. It could be another rookie in Jalen Duran. It could be Kevin Knox. Uh, beef, our boy Beef Stew, Isaiah Stewart, who's more of a five. And the Magic is throwing yeah. plenty of beef out there as well uh, yeah. with, with Wendell Carter. And Franz Wagner expected to play a lot. So I guess the, the total's low because you think a rookie might not get a ton of usage here in his first game, but he's projected for 30 minutes. I mean, they're going to give the number one pick his his time and his share of the ball, and he's very skilled. So f- you can walk into 15 points pretty easily in, in a free-flowing NBA game like this one. Yeah, for, for plus money, absolutely. I think he's going to be a bit of a, a focal point in the offense, right? So uh, what, what, 15 points, that I think that's going to be, um, you know, we'll see. Obviously, I think he's going to be expected to do a few things uh, as well, uh, you know, outside of just scoring. Um, so, you know, really not not too uh, worried about the, the 15 points, though, with the plus money there uh, in game one for the Rook. So let's, let, let's, let's get it, Paolo, because he is also on my fantasy squad. Finishing things off. Uh, with a guy who was picked right before my pick, and so I couldn't get him. Uh, everybody cares about everybody else's fantasy teams, I know. Josh G'day, uh, 29 and a half. We're always talking points, rebounds, and assists with, with our guy, right? Uh, minus 106 on FanDuel. I'm going over for the guy. This is your joke, but I'm taking it. I'm going over for the guy from down under. Uh, his last 12 to end the season, 16 points a game, nine boards, seven assists, we're talking about a 25% usage rate on a team that has Shea Gilgis on it um, and Lou Dort, who, who gets a lot of uh, run and sees the ball a lot. 34 minutes a game, and that's what we're looking for. Is like we did. I think we started to be able to rely on Josh Giddy being the Thunder player that would play a lot. I think if Chet Holmgren was playing, we'd be a lot more insured that they're that they're just going to play normal lineups and try and play their best players and just start winning now and not really suck for Victor Wembanyama. Almost got it. I'll be there in a, in a little in a few games. I'll have that down. But my, my main point is, is like I'm still a little bit nervous that they're not committed to winning with Chet going down once again. We'll see. Uh, I'm hoping that's not the case, in which case I do think no matter what, you can rely on Mr. Giddy uh, to be getting in, in there with, you know, if he's on the floor and he's getting his run at those 34 minutes a game. 30 points, rebounds, and assists uh, is going to feel like a steal uh, in a few months' time for him. So that is all the time we have for you guys in this one. Make sure to like and subscribe to that page. Continue to follow along with us. Follow along with all these player props as we are going to be bringing them to you each and every weekday of this regular season. Keeping that record, trying to stay strong with you guys as we were last year. So until we see you next, happy betting.